Dr. Singh, please feel free to share your slides. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Vikesh Singh. Dr. Singh will be speaking on non-opioid management of abdominal pain caused by chronic pancreatitis. Dr. Vikesh Singh is an associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He received his training from Brigham and Women's and Johns Hopkins Hospital. And um, he is the director of endoscopy, director of the pancreatitis center, director of the TPIT program and the medical pancreatology fellowship program. Um, so uh, Dr. Singh has done extensive research across the spectrum of pancreatic disorders. And uh, I'm fortunate to be acquainted by Dr. Singh and mentored by Dr. Singh for over 10 years. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Venkit, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, thank you to uh, CAPER for the uh, opportunity to give you a talk today on the non-opioid uh, management of abdominal pain caused by uh, chronic pancreatitis. I have some disclosures, but none are relevant to today's talk. Um, I have a couple of objectives th that I would like to touch upon in the course of this uh, talk. Um, we will talk a little bit about the impact of pain in chronic pancreatitis, why we should avoid opioids, what have we learned about the pathogenesis of pain in chronic pancreatitis, what can we use to medically manage pain in our patients with painful chronic pancreatitis? And uh, where I, I think the future really lies uh, um, in terms of managing these patients. So uh, in terms of uh, the impacts of uh, chronic pancreatitis pain, I think it's important to note that uh, the pain of chronic pancreatitis, particularly when it's constant, is associated with a lower quality of life, higher rates of disability, hospitalization, and opioid use. Also, when the pain is severe, it's associated with a lower quality of life and opioid misuse. Uh, there have also been studies that suggest that chronic pain, particularly in the setting of chronic pancreatitis, can lead to cognitive decline. And we certainly know that the impacts of opioid treatment on pain are also significant. So we now know that the highest rate of opioid prescriptions for a GI disease uh, is actually chronic pancreatitis, sort of registering at about a quarter of all opioid prescriptions written for GI diseases, with number two being liver disease at 13.9%. We know that high, high rates of, uh, or high um, uh, opioid dosage of, uh, near, of 100 milligrams per day or more is a risk factor for hospitalization. And recent studies have also shown that opioid use uh, disorders found in about 4% of chronic pancreatitis patients. So why should we try to avoid opioids? So I, I think, you know, many of these uh, GI associated side effects of opioid analgesics are well known uh, to, the, um, to those who are on this call. We know this includes everything from inhibition of lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, um, spasm of the sphincter of OD, uh, which of course has been implicated as a mechanism, for example, with uh, the recent, uh, uh, um, with the recent uh, IBS-directed drug Viberzi, uh, which we know is a weak opioid, can result in spasm of the sphincter of OD. Uh, it can also inhibit gastric emptying, uh, resulting in gastroparesis-like uh, symptoms. It can stimulate non-propulsive non small large bowel motility increased pyloric and internal annual sphincter tone, and sometimes most concerningly, really, the, uh, the opioid-induced hyperalgesia and bowel dysfunction can be quite problematic as it's quite difficult to treat and can often result in a separate uh, pain syndrome that is one that's uh, uh, um, distinct from the, the pain of, of chronic pancreatitis. We also know that Preoperative opioid use can reduce the impact of intervention in chronic pancreatitis. So we do know that uh, there are reduced pain relief rates after thoracoscopic uh, uh, splanchnechectomy across 16 studies that evaluate about 484 patients with chronic pancreatitis. We also know that about 20% of patients who use opioids prior to surgery uh, for chronic pancreatitis revert to opioid usage even after an initial pain response. So clearly preoperative opioid use in our chronic pancreatitis patient population has, uh, it can certainly uh, reduce uh, the impact of these interventions. At least since 2014, it's been advocated uh, first by the American Society of Anesthesiologists and Pain Medicine Specialists in their Choosing Wisely campaign that we really shouldn't be prescribing opioids for uh, patients with chronic non-cancer pain syndromes. And that was really the number one recommendation that they had promulgated in their Choosing Wisely um, uh, initiatives. 
Uh, although I, although this was uh, this had come out nearly seven years ago, it wasn't really until the 2016 CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain that there was greater attention paid uh, about the uh, uh, the opioid epidemic in the United States and and some of the adverse impacts of being on opioids for particularly chronic non-cancer pain syndromes. And while I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, certainly this uh, CDC guideline had outlined some important principles for how we should be managing uh, pain using opioids uh, uh, in, in patients with chronic pain syndromes. I think this is also a very important point, and that really is, is that there, there has yet to be a study, uh, and in fact, there are very few. I think this is probably one of the best examples thus far. This was the SPACE um, randomized control trial, which looked at the effect of opioids versus non-opioid um, analgesics on pain-related function in patients with uh, chronic back a hip or knee osteoarthritis pain. And really they found no difference at one year between opioids and non-opioid analgesics. Uh, and uh, you know, while this has not specifically, been, a trial of this nature has not been specifically uh, pursued uh, or performed in chronic pancreatitis, I think some of the principles uh, for chronic pain syndromes in general can apply across all of the various disorders for which we use opioids. So uh, what have we learned about uh, chronic pancreatitis pain? Uh, certainly, I think a, a lot of us think about the neurobiologic principles of pancreatic pain. We do know that uh, the chronic inflammation uh, that affects the pancreas resulting, results in an inflammatory cascade that can then activate uh, the um, uh, no, primary uh, nociceptive uh, pancreatic um, sensory nerves that then uh, synapse at the level of the dorsal root ganglia and then proceed through the spinal cord, through the spinothalamic tracts of the spinal cord to the pain centers of the brain. We also know that uh, over time, uh, there, uh, there is really plasticity that develops at the level of the pancreas, uh, at, at, which can also over time result in both uh, peripheral and central sens sensitization, which is really hyper-responsiveness of the central nervous system to pain, uh, despite the fact that there may be no ongoing nociceptive inputs from the pancreas into the central nervous system. Now, we know that this, uh, this, these neural pathways are probably the, uh, the better overall explanation for the pain of chronic pancreatitis, as opposed to the presence of intraductal hypertension uh, that results in pancreatic ductal obstruction by stones and strictures. Um, as you can see on the right here, there have at least been two studies that have come, uh, come out of uh, um, the, the German group headed by Gorab Kehan, uh, looking at the impact of, um, uh, of inflammation of the pancreatic nerves, as well as that inflammation leading to neurohypertrophy and density uh, of the nerves within the pancreas, really what we call this pancreatic neuroplasticity, that eventually then uh, can result in both the peripheral and central sensitization that's found in patients with painful chronic pancreatitis. And in fact, when you take a look at um, uh, the nerves uh, in individual patients, you begin to see that there are really marked differences. Um, here, uh, this is using a panneuronal uh, staining marker known as PGP 9.5. And as you can see, there's a patient with chronic pancreatitis on the left who's got an increased density and volume of pancreatic nerve fibers compared to somebody who's an otherwise normal patient on the right-hand side where the pancreatic nerves, while they form a lattice through the parenchyma of the gland, uh, there's a, a much lower volume and density of, of nerves. Uh, what's really curious is when you look through history and look at what really ultimately led to our current uh, interventional management paradigms of patients with uh, presumed introductal uh, pancreatic hypertension, it's really largely based on this N of one study, uh, which was published by a surgical group in Seattle, Washington in 1970. And as you can see in this patient um, on the right-hand side, I just found a good graph that I sort of uh, showed how this uh, operates. But this was a patient who had uh, chronic pancreatitis and they had a, a, a stone that was obstructing the pancreatic duct at the level of the head. And this had resulted in, the, in an upstream pseudocyst into which the surgeon had actually placed a catheter where they could measure pressure and also infuse the pancreatic ductal system with um, saline. So uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, every time they uh, infused uh, saline into the pancreatic ductal system and exceeded 25 millimeters of mercury in terms of pressure, uh, the patient reported pain. So the theory then, let, and remember, this is prior to the time of endoscopic sphincterotomy. Uh, so therefore, you know, it was a relatively closed loop system, not that there wouldn't be some drainage around the point of obstruction in the head of the pancreas. 
but nonetheless, uh, clearly instilling uh, saline into this duct led to these uh, to an increase in pressure. But we do know that uh, that subsequent studies in larger numbers of patients showed really very little correlation between introductal pressure and pain uh, when we when when larger groups of patients were studied. There are really four determinants of all pain. Now, what we've been largely talking about is nociceptive pain, uh, really, which is the actual uh, propagation of uh, of uh, painful impulses from uh, from from perceived or actual tissue injury, which is, of course, what we find in chronic pancreatitis and sort of detailed up at the top, uh, showing that nociceptive circuit of painful impulses passing from the pancreas, synapsing at the level of the dorsal root ganglion, and then proceeding up into the pain centers of the brain, which brings us to a second determinant of pain, which is perception. There is a pain matrix in the brain that's involved in processing these nociceptive inputs back into the brain. Then there's a third component, which is suffering. And suffering really involves anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, relationship issues, life events, uh, autonomic dysfunction that can often accompany the pain response. All of these things are thought to be really associated with suffering. And last but not least are really pain behaviors. Uh, and pain behaviors include grimacing, uh, you know, seeking to lie in a supine position, rubbing the abdomen, uh, all of the things that we uh, are uh, often show as outward manifestations uh, of pain. And really, these are the four determinants of pain. What I'd like to focus on really uh, is the kind of the interplay between perception and suffering, because what's interesting is that the regions of the brain that are involved in pain perception are also the regions of the brain that are involved with the suffering uh, that, that is seen in so many patients. So really for many years, we've been focused as a medical community on the intensity of chronic pain, which at the end of the day is probably the wrong metric. And, and you know, while I don't like reading uh, right off of a slide, I think this is a very important uh, you know, concept that was raised in this perspectives piece for the New England Journal of Medicine almost six years ago. And I quote, the intensity of chronic pain can't be reliably predicted from the extent or severity of tissue damage since chronic pain is not determined primarily by nociception. Functional neuroimaging studies and other prospective clinical studies have shown that what feels like the same pain is initially associated with the classic sensory pain matrix brain regions involved in emotion and reward. Thus, over time, pain intensity becomes le linked less with nociception and more with emotional and psychosocial factors. Suffering may be related as much to the meaning of pain as to its intensity. Persistent helplessness and hopelessness may be the root causes of suffering for patients with chronic pain, yet be reflected in a report of high pain intensity. So really what this comes down to is, again, this interplay between perception and suffering and how much and how, um, how prominent a role suffering may actually play in the, in the pain response, uh, regardless of whether we're talking about a somatic or visceral pain disorder, such as chronic pain. We do know that clinical depression and anxiety are associated with pain and quality of life in chronic pancreatitis. Uh, this is a study uh, by the Pancreatic Quantitative Sensory Testing Consortium showing uh, uh, this was a, it involved a total of 161 patients. And as you can see on the on the left hand side, that you know the rates of anxiety and depression just simply increased uh, with the pattern of pain. And on the right hand side, you can see these radar charts, which show that those patients who have anxiety and depression have uh, impairment in all of the quality of life domains uh, as listed here, including global health, social functioning, cognitive functioning, physical functioning, and role functioning, uh, compared to those patients who do not have anxiety and depression respectively. We also know that genetic susceptibility uh, is, uh, is also associated, I, I should say the genetic susceptibility uh, 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 for depression and anxiety is also associated with constant and severe pain phenotypes and chronic pancreatitis. And there have been two uh, good recent studies from the NAPS2 consortium uh, looking at uh, the relationships between uh, both, uh, looking at the relationships between um, uh, uh, ge the genetic susceptibility loci associated with depression, anxiety, and post traumatic stress disorder uh, with severe, constant, and constant severe pain phenotypes. So just moving along, uh, uh, you know, now that we've discussed really what are the four primary determinants of pain and really the, uh, the strong uh, influence uh, of suffering on, on pain uh, perception, 
I, I think it's important now to sort of shift into what are the medical treatments for chronic pancreatitis pain at the current time. We certainly know that there are some therapies which have been shown to be ineffective, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about these, and really this, these include pancreatic enzymes, antioxidants, and at least one trial thus far evaluating the role of cannabis for the treatment of pain in chronic pancreatitis have not shown uh, an increase response in those patients receiving cannabis over placebo. Uh, we do know that alcohol and smoking cessation are important. We know that pain relief rates are higher both with pre and post-operative uh, cessation. Uh, and that really holds true for a range of interventions beyond surgery. And, and uh, cessation has also been shown in studies uh, really both evaluating endoscopy and surgery. Uh, what I wanted to highlight uh, in this talk, and that's probably not discussed too much uh, in, in many other talks uh, looking at treatments for, for chronic pancreatitis is really the use of neuromodulators. And probably the first really good trial evaluating a neuromodulator for the treatment of pain in chronic pancreatitis was this by uh, a Danish group uh, based in Aalborg, Denmark, uh, where they randomized 64 patients uh, equally uh, allocated to pregabalin and placebo and found that over three weeks, pregabalin reduced the average daily pain score by 36% in those patients receiving pregabalin compared to 24% in the placebo arm. They had started these patients on pregabalin at 75 milligrams twice daily and gradually increased to 150 milligrams, uh, uh, followed by 300 milligrams twice daily as max. So they didn't exceed 600 milligrams of pregabalin daily. And, um, and what was very interesting in this study was that most patients were also on opioid analgesics. Uh, so suggesting that maybe there's a, a differential point of action um, between these gabapentinoid class of medications uh, versus those patients uh, versus the site of action of, of opioid analgesics, which can be tends to be a, a little bit more broad uh, across all of the um, opioid uh, receptors. So that study was published in 2011, so nearly 10 years ago. Um, this was then followed by uh, a trial uh, conducted by the a group at the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology in India and published in 2016, looking at the combination of pregabalin and antioxidants versus placebo in patients who had initially undergone endoscopic treatment with ductal stone clearance of stones and or strictures. So this study randomized uh, 87 patients, uh, 42 uh, uh, were randomized to the antioxidant and pregabalin combination and 45 were allocated to placebo. And what you can see is that the placebo uh, group had higher, uh, had a reduced pain response compared to those patients who were on the combination of antioxidants and pregabalin. And really what's interesting is since we know that antioxidants have at least been shown in one large meta-analysis of the prior randomized control trials to be relatively ineffective for the treatment of pain and chronic pancreatitis, one can only assume here that the effect of pregabalin was likely independent of that of antioxidants in terms of uh, uh, reductions in pain. More recently, uh, there was another Indian group that uh, conducted a trial of, um, of pregabalin uh, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, that conducted a, a trial of, of pregabalin uh, and uh, an antioxidant combination compared to placebo in those patients who uh, did not require surgery or ERCP. These were patients who largely had small duct chronic pancreatitis. And what was interesting is that they found that there was a 58% uh, complete pain relief uh, versus 22% uh, in the um, in the placebo arm at eight weeks, uh, including a, a number of other changes in the visual analog uh, scale, ISBICI score, and the mean number of hospitalizations in those patients who received uh, pregabalin and antioxidants in combination compared to those patients receiving placebo. So I, I just want to finish up with, uh, you know, I know I'm running short on time and I want to allow some time to ask questions, but really what is the future for treating chronic pancreatitis pain? While this is a very busy slide, I, I think that where we're really headed, and I don't wanna really um, uh, spend too much time on this, but where I think we're really headed is trying to use uh, a better array of pain questionnaires and pain assessment tools, including some of the uh, pain assessment tools that have been recently studied and are slowly making their way out into practice, including things like functional MRI and pancreatic quantitative sensory testing, to really attempt to determine 
whether or not patients have some degree of sensitization versus those patients who may not have sensitization, and then subsequently then determining what treatments would be best to treat the individual patient. So I think really where we're headed is probably more of a precision medicine type uh, approach to the treatment of painful um, chronic pancreatitis. Uh, I, I do think that there will be um, some potential targets related to inflammation uh, that could be exploited for the treatment of painful chronic pancreatitis. Uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, damaged pancreatic cells release a host of inflammatory mediators and cytokines that then stimulate the pancreatic nociceptive afferents to release things like substance P and CGRP and neurokines that then can then stimulate platelets and mast cells to release other factors such as um, uh, histamine and nerve growth factor, which then subsequently uh, can activate the pancreatic nociceptive afferent. That's really what you kind of see here on the left-hand panel. On the right-hand panel, you can see how trypsin that's released from pancreatic damaged cells can lead to upregulation of TRYP-V1 receptors uh, um, uh, along the pancreatic nociceptive afferents. And I, the reason I bring this up is because, you know, there's a, there's a host of drugs that are in development or are already available that could potentially be used to exploit some of these inflammatory uh, mediators. Um, so, 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 for example, um, anti-CGRP uh, antibodies have been developed, uh, uh, antibody treatments have been developed for the treatment of migraine headaches. So they could potentially have a role for the treatment of chronic pancreatitis pain. There have been prior trials which have looked at um, uh, of looked at treatments or treatments directed against nerve growth factor, which unfortunately, unfortunately were stopped prematurely uh, because there were some um, adverse patient reactions uh, to the drugs. Um, and on similarly on the right hand side, TRIP V1 is a receptor that is actually um, that is acted upon by capsaicin. So there has even been some interest in potentially looking at a drug like capsaicin in the future for treating. Uh, the, at least the inflammatory pathways in chronic pancreatitis. Well, let's not forget that uh, if we only focus on these um, inflammatory nociceptive elements of pain of chronic pancreatitis, we are all, we're gonna all together still forget the suffering part of this, which is the, uh, the susceptibility to, um, e or the actual presence of clinical anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as the pathways that can be used to treat some of those suffering-oriented conditions. Uh, so we do know that, um, that uh, the central modulation of pain can be uh, acted upon uh, by, um, by drugs such as tricyclic antidepressants as well as SNRIs. Uh, so these may have an increasing role in chronic pancreatitis pain and are certainly now currently being used for the treatment of pain in patients with functional bowel disorders. Also, there are other centrally acting drugs such as ketamine. Uh, and we know that there is a trial uh, going on in Europe right now called the RESET trial to evaluate ketamine for treating the pain of patients with, uh, with chronic pancreatitis. Um, there has been some interest in using neurostimulatory dev devices, uh, which have been shown to be effective uh, for treating functional gastrointestinal disorders in adolescents based on this uh, trial that was published in Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology in 2017. But uh, similar to that, there's actually currently uh, a trial being conducted also in Europe about looking at uh, the possibility of vagal, vagal neuromodulation for pain treatment in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, last but not least, uh, there's also been some recent interest in looking at cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this has been used successfully for treating uh, functional disorders, including irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia. And uh, there is now even some studies that are underway uh, for using cognitive behavioral therapy to treat painful chronic pancreatitis. Uh, the, the top study here was just recently committed, uh, completed and showed that 50% of the patients who were in the, in the trial arm uh, versus, uh, were in the interventional arm, sorry, uh, um, compared to 13% in the placebo arm actually had a response uh, to, to CDT. And so a larger study is planned and just below uh, is a study that's ongoing looking at CBT therapy for the treatment of uh, pain and pediatric recurrent acute and chronic pancreatitis. So I think these are the key points in this talk, really pain and chronic pancreatitis is inflammatory and neuropathic, but with significant involvement of psychological slash psychiatric disease slash susceptibility. Avoiding opioids is important. Alcohol and smoking cessation is a must. Uh, pregabalin has increasingly been shown to be an effective therapy in combination with and without uh, procedures. And, uh, 
Last but not least, an increasing use of combination therapy directed at different components of pain and CP will likely be the future of managing this complicated condition. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was an excellent overview. Uh, so you have shown some good evidence supporting the use of neuromodulators and other therapies to treat pain and um, suffering. Um, reminder to the audience, like please, please leave some questions. And I see there's a question here from uh, one of the audience, John George. So his question is, do you use duloxetine in your practice for pain management in chronic pancreatitis? Please comment on how you use pregabalin and where these medications stand in pain ladder. Yeah, uh, uh, both both very good questions. Let me start with pregabalin. So, I, I'm, so I'm using pregabalin in two situations. Uh, one is it's actually my primary go-to treatment for patients with small duct chronic pancreatitis. So if I have a patient present with small duct chronic pancreatitis, you know, calcifications throughout the gland, a non-dilated duct, and they have pain, I will actually start with pregabalin as, uh, as, as my treatment. Um, I just saw there was another question that popped up is, is there any difference in effectiveness? Um, what's interesting is I have many patients whose insurance doesn't approve pregabalin for the treatment of painful chronic pancreatitis, and in them I use uh, gabapentin. Um, so I don't generally find uh, a difference in efficacy in responders, but sometimes gabapentin is associated with an increased risk of side effects. So I, in that sense, pregabalin is a little bit better tolerated. Uh, returning back to the first question, so outside of the small duct chronic pancreatitis patients, I also use pregabalin in those patients who have not responded to endoscopic uh, clearance of ductal obstruction. So uh, once I clear a pancreatic duct of stones and treat strictures, if my patient continues to have pain, then I put them on pregabalin. And that's really in concert and consistent with what the uh, Indian group did at uh, the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. Uh, and in their trial. Um, certainly, I'm not using the antioxidants, but I'm finding that to be a relatively effective way to treat uh, um, the pain in those large duct chronic pancreatitis patients. Now, in terms of dilazotine, dilazotine is a great drug. It's a great drug because it has very few side effects, but what I, what I generally find and what is generally true is that lower doses of dilazotine. So if you only use 30 to 60 milligrams, it has a good impact on depression and anxiety but it tends not to be effective for pain until you get to 90 to 120 milligrams a day. I don't go beyond 120 milligrams a day. This is a drug that has to be given at night because often it can make people a little fatigued or sleepy, but which is often good because a lot of these patients have difficulty sleeping. Uh, but typically you've got to get up to about 90 to 120 milligrams in the evening. And I will often use that to augment patients who are having a suboptimal response uh, to uh, gabapentin and or pregabalin. So I usually use it as, a, as an augmenting agent as opposed to a primary treatment drug. There are some people who believe that you should only use dilazotine or a tricyclic antidepressant such as nor, nortriptyline or desimepine and those patients who have some evidence of depression by some depressions questionnaire. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, dilazotine is so well tolerated that uh, I, I don't think anyone could hurt anyone by starting them on, on dilazotine. One thing to keep in mind is no neuromodulators in general outside of gabapentin and pregabalin do not work in those patients who are on opioids. So you must wean patients off of opioids if you really want to see a more substantial pain impact using neuromodulatory drugs. Thank you, Dr. Singh, Dr. Robertson, Dr. Hart for your excellent presentations today. It's 9.01 Eastern time, so we will have to wrap up the session. And thank you everyone for joining this evening. And remember uh, that all of these presentations will be available on the CAPER website and do join us next week. Good night, everyone. Thank you.